out this morning. And if you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I sort of said last week that I was going to preach on this this morning. And uh, I'm preaching two or three sermons here on uh, relationships. Uh, let, yeah, you know, last Sunday, and I'll refer to a couple of things from last Sunday this morning, I preached on the differences between men and women, which it's amazing that you have to preach on something like that in 2022, but uh, so many people get confused on that. Uh, so this, this, this morning, I'm going to preach on uh, just a little bit on marriage, and I've touched on this before, but you can never have too much of it. And uh, next week, I'm going to preach on uh, the relationship between children and parents. And then, so it's kind of like a small series. I don't often do series, but I've been thinking about this some as I observe relationships between men and women. And as I look at this world, trying to turn everyone into like uh, something that's not a man or a woman. So our world has been spending a lot of time and our government and, you know, our educational institutions have been spending a lot of time trying to make women masculine and men feminine until we can get to a point where we're all like just one. And that's not what the Bible intended. That's not what God intended. You know, girls should be girly in general. Now, this is okay to have some tomboy tendencies, I suppose, but girls should be girly. And men should be, you know, you know, manly, that kind of thing. And, and there are differences between us. And uh, so I wanted to touch on those. The Bible covers this a lot. And what we're going to cover this morning is the... Uh, definitive chapter on marriage. Uh, but there is a lot about marriage in the Bible. You know, from Genesis to Revelation, a lot about marriage is covered. And a lot of questions that people have are clarified. Paul writes about marriage in almost every letter that he writes to churches because everybody's curious about this. So we're going to read Ephesians chapter 5 beginning in verse 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, the Bible reads, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your many blessings to us, for your word and for the truths that it holds. Lord, I pray that you will help us to gain some knowledge and some insight from your word this morning. I pray that you will help me to get out of the way so that your words will come through clearly and easily understood. Lord, I pray if there be anyone here that doesn't know you, that they would come to know you today, Lord, calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So a couple of words about marriage before we begin. Here recently in the United States of America, the trend has been to not get married. Marriages are more rare today than they have been in the past. You know, there are statistics that people like to throw around, and one of those statistics is there are fewer divorces today than there were 20 years ago. Yeah, and that is true. And the reason there are fewer divorces is because fewer people are getting married. But marriage is an important institution. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says that marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Marriage is an honorable institution. 
And it is important for us to do this. You know, men and women get married, say those vows, with, and mean those vows, which are the most important vows you will ever say in your life. And, you know, till death do us part. I mean, those vows are important, you know, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, you know, the good and the bad, we are supposed to stick together. Now, I see a lot of, you know, these things in the news oftentimes and stuff when people are referring to their significant other and they talk about them as their partner. You know, of course, the Bible uses the term spouse or husband or wife. You know, we're not necessarily partners in this thing. This is different from like a partnership. Okay, we're not in business together. This is a different thing. This is a, we should be husband and wife. And another point that should go without saying, but in these days and age does not go without saying, a marriage has a husband and a wife in it. Okay, not two husbands, not two wives. These, these are not a marriage. Okay, now the United States of America may give you a piece of paper if you go that route which is a disgusting, you know, hard to comprehend route to, to go. But in the Bible, a marriage is between a man and a woman. They are a husband and a wife. Any other relationship is referred to in the Bible as an abomination unto God. So, you know, men with men, an abomination unto God. Women with women, an abomination unto God. Men with women who are not married is fornication. And if you look in the Bible, that is an extremely wicked sin. That is not sanctioned either. Neither is adultery. It should be one man, one wife, till death do us part. That's the way it is. And there's a lot about this written in the Bible. Because there are a lot of people, and I find it interesting that and, you know, even in the Gospels, when Jesus is having to spend time clarifying marriage, it is the religious leaders of the day that want him to say, you know, what, what can we get a divorce for? You know, that's not really what we want to do. But nothing has changed. There are a lot of religious leaders today, pastors, etc., who have been divorced that spend a lot of time justifying their divorce according to the Bible. Let me be clear. The Bible says that pastors are not to be divorced. They are to be the husband of one wife. And there is no getting around that. There is no justification for any other way than that. And here we see some information here. Now I started with verse 21. And I just want us to go through this uh, and just think about this a little bit. Because no matter how hard we try to make turn men into women and women into men, there are differences between us. Okay, there are physical differences, there are emotional differences, there are differences. Again, we are made to complement each other, as I talked about last week. Not necessarily, you know, be in competition with each other or anything like that. You know, a strong the strongest unit is a, a loving marriage between a husband and a wife, you know, the children are happy, the grandchildren are happy, everybody that's around that that couple's happy. You know, if that's a happy marriage and it is not hard to have a happy marriage. Some people might say it's easier said than done, <laughs> but it, it's really not that hard. There are only two rules, two rules. They are given right here in this scripture. And I want us to take a look at these rules and sort of, you know, really understand because I love this passage in the script, in the Bible. When it comes to marriage, I oftentimes will give this passage when I'm giving, you know, when I'm uh, doing a marriage and preach a little sermon similar to what I'm going to preach today because people get this passage messed up all the time. Because so many, you know, so people stop basically at verse 22 and they get into an argument. Because so many women do not like that idea of submitting to husbands, and so many husbands want to stop right there and not go any farther. So that's usually where we stop in this passage and we get into a, you know, an argument, but no, there are, are two pieces here. And why are these two pieces written? And I, I want us to delve into that just a little bit. Now, first verse 21 says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. 
You know, we as men and women should submit ourselves one to each other and other places that we won't have time quite to turn to for sake of time. For example, in the book of, it's either first or second Corinthians, Paul writes about marriage and he says that men and women are not to withhold themselves from each other and they are to submit to each other. He says, women, your body is not your own. And then he also says, guess what, man? If you are married, your body is not your own. <laughs> so he, you know, it is in both places there, we see. And so here we see that in verse 21, Paul does say, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now, in verse 22 through verse 24, we have a command to wives. And I want to take a look at that this morning. This is one that's a little bit controversial when it comes to women. And I want to explain why I think that is here in just a second. Verse 22 says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now let's notice that right there because every word in the Bible is there for a reason. Wives are to submit themselves to their own husbands. We live in a day and age where the Bible is under attack and people that are outside of Christianity and outside of the church want to attack the Bible as anti-woman. They want to say that the, that the Bible makes women second-class citizens, and they'll oftentimes point to this. But here, look, we're not talking about anything but marriage this morning, okay? In other words, people want to say, oh, look at this, and, you know, wives, submit yourselves to your husband, you know, puts them in a second-class, second place. No, it is careful to say, in this situation, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, it doesn't say submit yourselves to other husbands, right? It doesn't say, hey, women, you are to do whatever men tell you to do. Just a blanket general statement. It doesn't say that, no. And, you know, it doesn't say, hey, women, you're not allowed to work outside the home. It doesn't say that either. In fact, there are examples in the Bible of godly women who had employees who worked outside of the home. Deborah the prophetess. Uh, Abigail, who was the wife of Nabal, she submitted herself to Nabal, but when she commanded her servants, her employees, her male employees to go and do this for David and go and do that for David, they did not question her. They went and did it. She had employees. You see, there are em women in the Bible who have employees and who work. Now, the ideal situation for women when they have children is to focus on their children. We live in a day and age where it is not really possible to live successfully with women and with moms staying home. It, it, if a mom can be a stay at home mom, she should thank the Lord every day because that is a privilege that not a lot of women get because most of our money that we make as men goes to the government. So somebody's got to make a little more money so that we can do some things so we can have some things. Right. And so, you know, my wife, worked for a while until I was able to support both of us. And it did not happen right off in marriage. You know, she had to work in the evenings while I worked during the day so that we could afford a house. We could not afford a house otherwise. That was the way it had to be. Now, we, there got to a time when the kids got a little bit older and she was able to retire at 30. We actually threw a retirement party for her. And I praise God that we did because, you know, she only made it eight years after that. You know, so she got to enjoy a lot of, hey, you know, raising her kids, getting a strong bond with her kids, you know, so that was a wonderful thing. You know, they will never forget mom because she was around 24 hours a day, seven days a week for eight years, which was a wonderful thing for them. So, you know, if you're able to, to stay at home, you are one of the lucky ones. That being said, that is ideal for mothers, but we oftentimes can't do that in this day and age. And, and we understand that, of course, that, but, uh, you know, with that being said, within the realm of the family, wives are supposed to submit themselves unto their husbands. That is a command. Now, what I find interesting here, as we look at this, it says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. And several other passages in the scriptures are 
equal to this, saying, Wives, you should submit yourselves to your own husbands. The Bible does not command husbands to submit themselves to their wives necessarily. And sometimes I wonder why that is. Because later we're going to see that husbands are commanded to love their wives, but wives are not commanded to love their husbands. Why is that? Well, here's why I think that is. Because we as men, we naturally submit ourselves to our wives. <laughs> you know? It is something that we naturally do. For women, it is oftentimes unnatural for them to submit themselves to their husbands. That's why they need a command to do it. Let me explain what I'm talking about there. Okay? It, is my, it was always my inclination. Always my inclination to try to provide my wife with whatever she wanted. And because of her strong opinions and my lack of strong opinions on most things, I submitted to what she wanted to do most of the time. Quite, I mean, quite often. You know, if we were going to go to a restaurant and she suggested a restaurant, that was the restaurant we went to because I really didn't care. If, and, and you know, when we first got married and we were living in an apartment in Roanoke and we were looking for places, I remember the conflict was I wanted to look for a place out in Craig County. I love Craig County. It's very rural, not much out there. She wanted to find a place in Roanoke City. Guess where I live? <laughs> Roanoke City. Because that's what she wanted, and her opinion was stronger than my opinion. I was fine with Roanoke City. Kind of wanted to live in Craig County, but if that's... Yeah, and we have this, this saying as husbands, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> so we try to submit <laughs> to what our wives want. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. When I talked about this last week, Eve gave Adam fruit from the tree that they were not supposed to eat of, and he knew that. But because she gave it to him, he took it. He submitted himself to his wife. No problem. But women oftentimes have trouble submitting to men. They don't want to do it. You know? And I can just go from my own observations on this subject. As I was thinking about this, not even with husbands and wives, I think about the dynamic, for example, between my three children growing up. You know, there was an interesting dynamic there. My oldest is a boy. My middle one is a girl. My youngest is a boy. The most epic battles that were ever fought under the roof of the Bennett household were between my oldest, who is a boy, and my middle one, who is a girl. Because as the oldest, he did have more experience than she did in many things. But let me tell you something. If he tried to tell her to do something, the fight was on. Okay? Now, let's look at the dynamic between my middle daughter and my youngest son who always got along fantastic. Why? Because my youngest son was the youngest and he did whatever his older sister told him to do. Okay? I mean, that's obvious. Look, some, I mean, you know, I, I, some of the most intervening that I had to do was between my oldest son and, and I'm not mentioning her names because I'm going to put this on YouTube, my oldest son and my middle daughter, some, those were fights that I had to really, you know, go after. And let me tell you what I noticed in the overwhelming majority of those fights. My oldest son was right and my middle one that was the daughter was going to do that anyways. The problem is she did not want him to tell her to do that, <laughs> whatever it was. And, you know, we had to have those separation. It was just not a natural thing. You know, she did not want him to tell her what to do. And I can tell you that in the beginning stages of my marriage, when my wife was 20 or 21 and I was 23 or 24, we did, she did not always submit to my wishes either. But as we got more experience in our marriage, as we learned in our marriage, it got better as she read the Bible, she more understood, and she did listen to me more, <laughs> which made our marriage better. 
She submitted. I'm not saying she submitted to me all the time. By the way, I'm not saying I loved her all the time the way I should have either because sometimes we get a little bit selfish as guys. You know, I'm, that's part two here coming up. So, you know, it's not perfect, but in general, that's the way it was, and that's the way it worked. When she was able to submit herself to her husband and when the husband was able to love her as Christ loved the church, no better relationship when that happens. But the reason that she had to have a, she has to have a command to submit herself to her husband, own husband, because oftentimes that's not something that she wants to do. But again, husbands oftentimes don't have that trouble. I will never forget a time because, you know, my wife, she, she would, she, you know, it's, it's amazing. We had a great marriage. And she would do things to make me happy. Imagine that. Even if it inconvenienced her a little bit. You know? Because some of her friends and family members found that to be just degrading to women. You know, the ones with the broken marriages who were divorced and whose husbands had left them and those kinds of things. You know, they found some of the things that my wife did to be utterly ridiculous. You mean you let your husband tell you what to do? And there was one particular instance, which I've told this story before, that I found, you know, right now you can see I have a beard and a mustache. You know? By the way, when Tanya and I first started dating, I had a mustache. I was pretty tickled with it. You know, most people thought it looked ridiculous, but I thought it looked great. You know, the, the, the mustache. She did, she did not like facial hair. So during our marriage, I shaved every day. Completely. Smooth shaven. Okay. Now I've told this story before because she did corner me one time. She, she would got, she got her hair cut real short one time. She said, do you like it better, longer or shorter? You know, and you know, I, I tried to, you know, I tried to use all the things that men try to use to get out of this, you know, situation. Yeah. Looks great either way, you know, whatever, you know, I love you. However you are, you know, you don't look fat, whatever, you know, all these kinds of things, you know, that you, you use to try to get out and Oh, you know, look at the time, you know, or something to try to get, get away from, you know, those questions, because again, we don't, you know, we don't really thrive on conflict when it comes to our wives, you know, as men, so we're looking, but no, I got cornered, I got cornered, you know, chalk it up to inexperience or whatever, and I had to answer this question, do you like my hair long or short, and I just told her, I said, well, I, I've always been partial to long hair, and you know, she never cut her hair again until she had cancer, and her, she had the longest, prettiest red hair, that took for ever to take care of because you know it does you know most of you women know hey look when my hair was long you know it took forever to take care of it took, took, took her like 20 minutes to wash it and dry it and whatever you know and she's, she's really working on it and so most of her family had short hair and they asked her about her long hair one time I was in the room and she said that she kept her hair long because her husband liked it and you should have heard well, I didn't, no man would ever tell me what to do now it says says these people with broken marriages who are not there with a husband Okay. All right. So look, it is, it's not a bad thing to ask your husband what he likes and to do it for him. We, we men are not complicated. Okay. And, and by the way, we like to be buttered up and you know, there are places in the Bible that talk about here. You know, for example, Peter touches on the subject of marriage. And one of the things he says is wives, you want to win your husband's over? Be nice. That's basically what he says. Be nice. Be nice to them. You know, you want that job done that he's not, he hasn't done, you know? I mean, look at, I, I look at Esther in the Bible. Esther wanted her husband to do something. What did she do? She made him a big meal twice before she asked him <laughs> to do something. <laughs> you know? So look, this is, this is what we want to, you know, this works. Okay. It works better than, you know, angriness and nagging and things like that. Now, if the big meal doesn't work, maybe you have to go to nagging. I don't know, but I would try the big meal first. That would be that, that will get him, that would you know, get things working better. So you can see all that. So, you know, when it says husbands submit yourselves to your own husbands, that's a command because I'm telling you right now, I have observed it in the women in my life. It is not a natural thing for women to submit themselves to their husbands. It is something that they must be told to do by the Bible. And so that's what they do. Right now. Let's look at the other side because there is another side. See, we can't just stop right here. You know, we've got a second part to a happy marriage. See so here, verse 25. Husbands, 
love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Look, when, when men love their wives, you know, the way, you know, because Paul says, look, this is a picture of Christ in the church. You know, Christ loves the church no matter what it does. You know, he will always love the church. He will always forgive the church because the church is not perfect. He gave himself for the church put himself into an extremely inconvenient situation by hanging on the cross, etc. Yeah, And I will tell you right now that men are to love their wives as Christ loved the church as much as possible. There's no doubt about that. You know, I, I am one that says women should submit themselves unto their own husbands. And people say, oh, man, you're, you're, you're anti-woman. No, because here's something else I will say. The vast majority of divorces in the United States of America, the vast majority, if men are in charge of the marriage, then the vast majority of divorces are the man's fault. That just makes sense because he's the boss. And so many people get divorced for you know a couple of reasons. Number one is money. They get argue, argue over money. You know, but also... You know, he is not giving the wife as much love and attention as he is supposed to, according to the Bible. I mean, I will tell every man this right now. Your number one concern is for your wife and your children. Your needs and your desires and your wants come after that. You know, it's great for a man to have fishing trips and boats and whatever, you know, a motorcycle, for example. Okay. But those things should come after everything else. That's why I have a motorcycle now and never had one before because of the fact that there was no money for a motorcycle before because my wife and my children needed the money, needed the stuff. Yeah. Now I have the ability to splurge on myself a little bit. And so I will do that. But it wasn't always the case. You know, I still have people living under my roof, by the way. You know, children and a grandchild. And they still, in my opinion, come first before myself. It's the way I am built. It's the way it is ingrained into me. Look, I am the man. I'm the father, the husband, whatever, you know. And it, it is my responsibility to make sure that everybody else are taken care of before me. Isn't that the way Christ loved the church? Didn't he take care of the church before everything else? So our number one responsibility is to our family. It has to be that way. When it is that way, I can tell you, when it is that way, life is great. I may not get everything that I want, but I have things that I didn't expect to have. You know, like children who still think I'm great, even in their 20s. That is, an, a, that is a, a blessing, by the way, <laughs> you know, to have children that think you're still awesome when they're in their 20s, <laughs> you know, after they are able to get away from you, you know, and they still, they still, you know, well, dad can fix anything. You know, dad, you know, let me rely on dad, you know, for this or for that, you know, and all three of mine, as far as I know, still think I'm pretty, you know, you know, the guy that can fix whatever needs to be fixed, you know, the guy to come to for advice, all that kind of stuff. Because I still have that mentality of, you know, even though I, you know, I'm not their boss, they're all adults. But in my mind, I still have the mentality of, hey, they should be taken care of before me. I mean, I look at my parents, you know, my father is 77 years old. You know, I make plenty of money but he will still ask me if I need any money, if I'm at their house, I'll, you know, go and get them a case of water. You need some money, you know, go get some, you know, going to do something. Hey, you need any money for gas? It's still his mentality as well. We, it, it should never leave us as men, no matter how old our children get, or, you know, no matter how long we've been married to continue to be the, 
take on the responsibility of, look, everybody under my family, I'm responsible for their well-being as much as possible. Not always the case. You know, we will always have a prodigal son or a daughter or two that are out there in the world, you know, that we worry about or are concerned about, but they're adults now and they got to do their own thing or whatever. But our mentality is, how can I make sure that they're all right? That's, that's what we should do. And look, that's the relationship between Christ and the church as well. He gave himself for it. And men should give themselves for their wives. That's why, you know, because we are different. And we look at this and, you know, men, for example, are not that complicated. You know, women are a little more complicated. But this is why, you know, marriage, one of the many reasons why marriages between two men, not, you know, beyond the fact that it's disgusting, or marriages between two women, you know, are not going to work because they're not designed to be together in that way. It's men designed with women to be together because, because then we, 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 you know, we fit, we match, it works. You know, men are to give women honor as accorded to the weaker vessel. We are to look after them. You know, so we can see all of that here. So, you know, Paul is writing about this. And, you know, look down there at verse uh, 32. Verse 32, this is a great mystery, he says. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. So he's saying, look, I am giving you the way husbands and wives should be and as an illustration of the way Jesus Christ is with the church. He says, so this, sometimes this is a mystery to people, but he says there in verse 33, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, so love his wife, even as himself, men, we are to concentrate on being able to love our wives, even as ourselves. The Bible says in the last days, which is where we live, which is why marriage is not as popular as it once was, which is why there are so many single mothers out there. What does the Bible say about the last days? Men shall be lovers of them, their own selves. Yeah. Not, you know, they, they, in other words, they're going to be overly selfish. They're going to think of their own needs first. And isn't that what we see out there in the world with all these young men out there? You know, they will wine and dine these, these naive young women you know, and then they'll leave them. And then they have, you know, these babies that they have to take care of because men will be lovers of their own selves in the latter days. But here it says, every one of you in particular, so love his wife, even as himself. That's what we need to focus on. And then it says there in uh, the second half of it, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. You know, that's something that we need to, to focus on. You know, you want a happy husband? Tell him how great he is. You know, we, I mean, look, we take compliments from the wife. You know, that's, that's a good thing. Tell him he's awesome. You know, man, you know, that's a great job you did there or whatever. You know, I mean, that, I mean, it worked with Tanya and me. You know, she wanted something really, she, she, she had, she had two methods of getting what she wanted from me. Number one was buttering me up. And number two was ask Lila to get me to do it. Cause you know, Lila was, they always said I was, you know, partial to my daughter. And I, I was of course, but, uh, you know, yeah, that's what she would always say. She'd always say, well, then, you know, I'll, I'll try one of these two methods. And it 99% of the time it worked. And the one one percent of the time, maybe that it didn't work because there were, and I can just think back over our marriage you know, there were just a, a few times when I had to tell my wife, no, we cannot do that. And not very often when we would collide in opinions and I had to say no. Because if this method that Ephesians chapter 5 is followed, you're not going to have to say no to your wife every week. Yeah. And she's not going to have to nag you every week to get something done. We're not perfect, though, so every once in a while there is going to be a conflict. And there is going to be a problem. But those times when I did have to say no, as our marriage stretched longer, she would accept that more and more. You know, when our marriage was young, you know, that there, there might have been a little, little bit of a battle there or something. But as our marriage got to that five-year mark or whatever or ten-year mark, then she would accept no because it was my decision. 
And she knew that for the most part, I always said yes, even if it inconvenienced me a little bit because I wanted her and the kids to be happiest. And look, you know, if you, I mean, if you believe, if you believe that women should submit themselves to their own husbands, then you had better also believe that husbands should have their wife's interests in mind before themselves. It has to be both in order for a marriage to be successful. When, you live in, when, you, when you're in a successful marriage, there's nothing greater. I have no doubt because I have been in a successful marriage. There's nothing greater than having that person by your side that you can always rely on. Two simple rules, but again, easier said than done. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The other things, of course, go without saying. Look, a marriage is a man and a woman, not two women and a man or two men and a woman or woman or two men. And, you know, it's just going to get worse. I mean, if the United States can get money off of it, they will let you marry anybody or anything. You know, a chest of divorce, you know, or whatever. You know, because that's all they care about is money. So, uh, but the Bible clearly says what a marriage is, what it's supposed to be, everything is laid out there. And I want us to, you know, when you study it, don't get hung up on something and immediately get offended by it until you really think about what the Bible is saying. Because the Bible is not anti-woman. The Bible does not, by the way, say that a woman should stay with her husband even if he beats her every week. No. The Bible says, look, if you need to leave him, leave him. That's what Paul says. But it also says, if you leave him, don't get married again, or that's adultery. Oh, but that's, that's not fair. Welcome to life. It's not fair. Yeah. Oh, but how can I be not married for years? Look, don't come to me with that garbage. Okay, because I've lived it. I know it can be done. Is it hard? Maybe. But so, you know, those people come up with all kinds of reasons and all kinds of excuses for their own sin. Sometimes doing what's right is not doing what's easy. But doing what's right is what we should always strive to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your many blessings to us and for your word and for all the truths that it holds. Lord, the Bible has a lot to say about marriages, about successful marriages, unsuccessful marriages, about the importance of marriage, Lord, and how marriage is really the foundation of an extremely strong family that believes and trusts in you, which is why this world has been trying to destroy marriage for so long. Help us to gain knowledge and insight from this here, Lord, 